All right. Thanks, Sam, for the wonderful introduction <laughs> today and 20, was it 21 years ago also. So, um, yeah, what, what I'll do is I, I do want to talk about Eunice Carter and, and we were talking with Sam a couple minutes ago. And I'll get to this in the talk, but what is really compelling, I think, about Eunice's story is not just Eunice, but her family. She she has this incredible family, which I hope I can, you know, I, I'm not going to be able to tell you everything about them just because of time. But as, as I was researching this, my husband, you know, who, who was reading the drafts, um, knew about Eunice, but not about her family. And in the middle of it, he said, wow, this is it's almost like roots in that it was this this kind of family that had gone through a lot but really thrived and they served as, as kind of um, trailblazers. So we'll get to that, you know, as we go on. But I'll give you what the headline of who Eunice was and then get to some of the more um, some, some of the things we found. And in a nutshell, Eunice was the only woman and the only person of color on the team that prosecuted Lucky Luciano and the mob in 1936. And this was, you know, they called it the trial of, of the century, which there were a lot of trials of the century, but, it, but that speaks to how important it was back in 1935 and 1936 and the, and the you know, the coverage that it got. And um, this was, this was an amazing achievement for not just a woman to be on the team, but a woman of color, and you know, it, it was mostly white guys. And I'll tell you how we even found out about Eunice. Um, it was just a fluky thing. We were at the Mob Museum. If you're not familiar with the Mob Museum in Las Vegas, you have to go. It, it is a serious museum. It's, it's a wonderful museum, um, not on the Strip, but, but in downtown Las Vegas. And we were in Las Vegas at a wedding and we had some time to kill and we were like, what do we want to do for, you know, three or four hours? And just by a stroke of luck, there happened to be a review in the New York Times that day of the Mob Museum in Las Vegas. And it was this review that said, this is just a, a wonderful museum. You, you know, you've got to go. So we said, let's go. And, and, and if you do go, leave about three or four hours because it's huge, a huge museum. But anyway, we were having a lot of fun. We were looking at the history of the mob and then we we went into this little room where it talks about Lucky Luciano. And let me, let me see if I can, yeah, there he is, um, <laughs> famous mugshot. It was talking about Lucky Luciano and the mob. And they talked about this team of 20 attorneys and they were considered the best attorneys in New York and possibly the country. And they were head, head by um, Thomas Dewey who you might know as later as, as he ran for president, but at this point he was a special prosecutor out to get the mob. So they had these photos of all the guys on the team, you know, and they were framed and you can imagine it was, you know, white guy, white guy, white guy, white guy. And they were youngish, most of them. And then right in the middle of, in the team, there was this black woman. And I, you know, we, I turned to my husband, I said, there's gotta be a story behind that, you know, but I was working on something else at the time, but, I thought, how on earth did this happen in an era of racism and sexism, you know? Um, but anyway, so that was put on, on hold for a while. And then a couple years later, I contacted the Mob Museum and I didn't even know her name. And I said, who was that person? And can you tell me again, you know, anything more? And they said, yeah, not only was she on the team that, that prosecuted the mob, she was actually responsible for making the link and getting the, actually getting the evidence, which I'll get to later, that prosecuted the mob. So, so it was more than just she was on the team. She was a pivotal member of the team. So that's how, that's how it got started. Now, and before I talk about, about her, I started you know, trying to find out about Eunice, well, who was she? Did anybody write about her? And the bottom line was she was in a few anthologies of, you know, people. She had a short New York Times obituary, which means she was somebody, I guess. But there wasn't a lot on her. So that was a good thing. The bad thing is 
there wasn't a lot on her. So what do you write about? I mean, you know, could this be more than just a magazine article if you don't have a lot? She was born in 1899. So a lot of her, well, all of her contemporaries were gone. She had grandchildren and great grandchildren. Um, but, you know, nobody you could really interview per se who was there. It was not it just didn't look good. So I was working with a graduate student of mine who now works at CNBC. And she was really a good grad student. He said, you know, this is an interesting topic. I just don't know what to do because I can't find anything else on her. And so my grad student, Yoon, who is my co-author on this, you know, we're chatting and she said, well, let me look into this. So she does a little research and she said, you know, Eunice Hunton, when she was, you know, in her 20s and just graduated from Smith College, and this is another thing you can imagine, in the 20s, um, a black woman at Smith College, I mean, there were some, but very few. She graduated with two degrees, a master's degree and a, and a bachelor's degree. Well, anyway, she was doing some writing for a freelance um, kind of arts magazine. And my co-author and former student, Ewan, said, you know, I dug up some of her writing and look at this. And, and it was fiction and it was uh, short stories and it was reviews. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking, this is seriously good writing. I mean, this isn't an amateur who's talented. This is somebody who's a seriously good writer. So we started doing a little more research on her. Then we found out about Tom Dewey, who was the special prosecutor. So Ewan decides, let, let me go to the archive of Tom Dewey and see what I can find out, which is in Rochester, New York. And she finds out that when Tom Dewey decided to get the mob, you know, he was like the, the Robert Mueller of his day. <laughs> he decides to get the mob. And what does he do? As soon as he's named to get the mob, everybody's, you know, calling him and, you know, the, the newspapers, because that's newspapers and radio were primarily the, the, the media at the point. And they're like, we want to know all about this. And they're bugging him, they're bugging him, they're bothering him. So Tom Dewey arranges meetings with some publishers of the era, one by one, takes them to lunch, whatever, and says to them, if you leave us alone and our big, you know, you know, investigation of the mob, just leave us alone, give us a year, we will tell you everything we have once we're willing to go public. And these publishers agreed to that. And you and you know, we got little, we got little um, memos from these publishers saying, yeah, that looks, <laughs> that looks good. And we, and Ewan and I were laughing because we said, can you imagine CNN, you know, Mueller going to CNN or MSNBC, just leave us alone. And in a year, we'll, <laughs> we'll tell you everything you want to know, but they agreed to it. So, so, so I guess my point is gradually these things were, you know, these facts were building up, these interesting stories were building up about what was going on here now. So, so Dewey decides, all right, he, he gathers this team of what he says are the best attorneys in New York. She's one of them. He names a couple Jewish attorneys, which was well, it's unheard of then. You know, you would not, you would not name an, a Jewish attorney because of the anti-Semitism of the era. So he said, I just want the best. It doesn't really matter to me. So in this way, Dewey was a, was, was a little bit ahead of his time because he, you know, he, it didn't, he said it didn't matter to him, it didn't matter to him. Well, what happened was he gave a radio address um, before the team started doing its investigation. And this was the most wonderful address you ever heard. I, I didn't hear it, but I read the transcript. And in it, he told everybody in New York, the mob affects everything you do, every step you take, everything you eat. Is, uh, is affected directly or indirectly by the mob. So he really was ahead of his time when it came to marketing, when it came to you know, getting people interested in what he was doing. So this was essentially the person who you know, led this investigation. Now, Tom Dewey um, was a fascinating character. And what really interested you and, and I about this, you had three really brilliant people who were working together, working against each other. You had Thomas Dewey, who was this talented attorney um, and pretty wily. 
I mean, who else would meet with publishers and say, leave us alone and we'll, we'll give you everything? Who else would have a radio announcement and you know, say, this is how the mob affects you? You had Eunice, who we'll get to about you know, how brilliant she was. And then you had Lucky Luciano and the mob. And a lot has been written about Luciano. Um, he was also brilliant. I mean, we did, we did a lot of research on the mob of the era. And Luciano, all these people, all three of these people were in their 30s at the time. So they were young. In fact, there was, they were very close in age, three, four, five years difference in, in all three of them. Luciano is credited with kind of bringing the mob into the current age. So in the, in the mid 20s, late 20s, Luciano was kind of a middling player, but he felt the mob was in the stone age, right? He wanted to bring it to current times. And um, he wanted, he's credited really with actually forming organized crime because he organized it. He was the one, he said at one point, you know, I want it to be like the A&P, which was a huge chain of grocery stores or, or U.S. Steel. He, he pretty much, once he got power, um, you know, turned the mob into essentially a conglomerate you know, a, a company, a, a pretty brutal company. But anyway, brilliant guy, very dapper, wore, you know, whatever it was, $800 shoes or, or what they were, it would have been $800 shoes, you know, in today's, in today's money, very expensive suits. And kind of a, and let me, I'll go backwards. I mean, in a weird way, he's kind of a handsome guy. I mean, he's very craggy looking, but I mean, he's, he had the thick, thick black hair, you know, you know, dressed well. So, so he, was a, he was a pretty interesting character. But what Dewey did, people outside of the mob really didn't know that much about Lucky Luciano in 1935. You, you knew him if you were in the mob. You didn't know him if you weren't in the mob. So another kind of clever thing that Dewey did, he knew there had to be a symbol of the mob. It can't be the mob. It has to be a person who represents the mob. So he took Lucky Luciano and kind of made him a symbol of the mob. Um, he became kind of the person that he wanted everyone to hate. So he represents the mob. So all this was going on. Um, you had three really brilliant people kind of up, up against each other. I mean, Dewey and, and Eunice, of course, weren't against each other, but um, you know, they, they were part of a team that, that got Luciano. One thing, and I, I, I have given a couple other talks on this and I, I keep forgetting to say it. One thing that, that Luciano, I guess there was a lesson if you worked with Luciano, be careful if you were his friend <laughs> because he would very quickly turn on you and, and, and have you murdered. Um, he was, when he was in his mid, um, late twenties, he worked for a mob boss. I don't remember his name. He's, he's not a, he's not a well-known name. And uh, another mob boss said, Hey, work for me. Don't work for the other guy." So Luciano had a hit on the first boss. All right. He goes to work for the second boss. Things are going okay. Then he, they have an argument. So he gets a hit on the second boss. <laughs> so you know, you, you couldn't, you know, the, the old thing, there's no honor among thieves. You, you couldn't trust Luciano because even if he worked for you, if you had a, a bad a disagreement, you, you were history, according, you know, with Luciano.